All right, well, uh, I want to welcome everyone here, um, full audience, uh, to the, the, the first seminar, RAL seminar of, of 2023. Um, I'm James Pinto. I am the Aviation Applications Program uh, Deputy Director, and I will be introducing Matt uh, Wilson here today. Uh, before I get started, I just want to point out for anybody here who wants to give a RAL seminar or anyone online, uh, just reach out and contact Jared Lee, um, and he can set you up. Um, we have lots of openings for 2023, so um, we'd love to hear the research that you're doing. So, um, so I had the pleasure of meeting Matt um, during the lapse rate field campaign, which took place in the San Luis Valley of Colorado in 2018. Uh, he was uh, involved with launching balloons, uh, radio sons during that project, and it was actually a, a UAS-centric uh, project uh, where we were doing targeted um, observations of various weather phenomena in the San Luis Valley. And, my, I myself am working with that data, uh, doing data simulation studies to assess the impact of those um, observations on sort of meso alpha scale type um, circulations, uh, including convection and terrain-driven flows. So anyway, it was, it was great to meet Matt then, and we've kind of discussed things on and off over the last few years. Matt uh, grew up in Akron, Ohio, and it, it, we were talking yesterday about how he got interested in the weather. and. I found out that at a young age, he was really fascinated by lake effect snow and the fact that uh, where he lived, they often kind of got the short end of the stick, but areas just to the north of him uh, oftentimes got over a foot and had school delays and cancellations while he was trudging off to school in three inches of snow. So he wanted to figure out why that was the case. Um, so we went on to study atmospheric science. He got his bachelor's degree in meteorology at Valparaiso uh, University. And then he moved on to the University of Nebraska Lincoln, uh, where he's completed his master's degree, uh, where he developed an automated algorithm to detect or to identify dual pole signatures in supercells. And for his PhD, he's continued his work on supercells, but has now started to migrate over to the data simulation side of things. And so today he'll be presenting his uh, PhD work on both doing observational analyses to understand why supercells evolve differently. Um, those occurring in the same environment evolving differently, and also doing some data simulation experiments to further understand um, why they do what they do. And so with, with that, I'll hand it over to Matt. All right, thanks for that introduction, James. Uh, can everybody hear me on the Zoom and everything? All right, good. So, yeah, let's see you guys. Hope you guys have enjoyed looking at this wonderful picture of the 8 June 2019 uh, second supercell we'll be talking about. There is an anticyclonic tornado in there, and that picture will be with us for the rest of the talk here. So I want to start off by uh, giving some acknowledgement here. So first, I want to thank Adam Houston for being an excellent advisor, uh, Conrad Ziegler and Dan Steckman at uh, OU NSSL kind of Sims for their work uh, helping with the P3 dual Doppler analysis you'll see in this presentation. Kent Knopfmeyer for providing the hurry ICs for the DA experiment, so I'm kind of the other side of this talk. Uh, the DART support team here at NCAR, they've been super helpful with all of my many, many, many questions getting to uh, learn and run DART. Uh, Chris Kerr, Anders Jensen, and James Pinto for other help with DART and really helpful discussions about how best to assimilate these UAS OBS. George Limper at UNL for assistance in compiling DART on our supercomputer, which was a fun process. And the Taurus team, uh, last but not least, of course, for collecting this wonderful data set I get to work with. So uh, without further ado, I'll talk about Taurus here. So what is Taurus? Well, Taurus stands for Targeted Observation by Radars and UAS of Supercells. And I think this is the first talk in which I got that acronym 100% right. Uh, the main goal of the project is to determine the role of internal boundaries and coherent features in whether a supercell produces tornadoes or not. So over here on the bottom left, we've got a figure from uh, Alex Sheath's work on the streamlined vorticity current. And it's a kind of a good example of a lot of these different boundaries and where they set up in supercells. So we've got the forward flank convergence boundary and kind of the edge of the cold pool. And that can be a source of both uh, low level vertical vorticity or possibly horizontal streamwise vorticity that's very clinically generated. Uh, the kind of big feature that a lot of recent work has focused on is the left flank convergence boundary and above it the streamwise vorticity current, so kind of this uh, orangish region here. And 
Those features, so along the left flank convergence boundary, you can often get vorticity rivers. So kind of rivers of vertical vorticity that move beneath the level of a mesocyclone and can provide the source of vorticity for tornado formation. The streamwise vorticity current is kind of above uh, the left flank convergence boundary or can also be above that forward flank boundary. And this is a kind of coherent tube of streamwise vorticity that can get tilted up into the level meso and really intensify that feature. And finally, you've also got the rear flank gust front and possibly rear flank internal surges. So you can see those in the torus diagram here. And those can also play a role in kind of wrapping up that low level uh, meso and the level of vorticity beneath it. So looking at our uh, torus kind of schematic, this is how the project was set up to sample these three different uh, kind of general areas. So we get the left flank mission that's looking at uh, the SVC and the LFCB and FFCB. So we kind of cross that with MOF mesonets and UAS above those MOF mesonets. And we've got the right flank mission, which is going into the rear flank behind kind of that low level meso and looking for rear flank internal boundaries and sampling that rear flank outflow. Uh, the mission that I was involved with as the mission lead for 2019 and 2019 to 2022 for this part of Taurus was near inflow. So I got to be the near inflow mission lead and kind of run this little tiny part of the large project. Uh, it was a lot of fun. So we're mostly looking at how the near storm environment gets modified by the storm in that mission area. So these are all the fun platforms we had with us on Taurus. Starting from the top left here, we had mobile mesonets to collect surface data, uh, radio sounds to get full tropospheric profiles uh, around the far field and near field of the storm. We had the Texas Tech radars to get kind of really fine scale uh, observations of the SVC and some of those internal boundaries. Uh, we had the NOAA P3 to get more of a broad sort of um, picture of the storm and also to get dual Doppler analysis because they had two tail Doppler radars on this aircraft, which were really great to work with. Uh, wind sounds, which are kind of Lagrangian drifters that were launched into different parts of the storm. The NOAA XP or NOXP radar, which was um, really useful for kind of situational awareness and getting a broader scale picture of that storm. LIDAR, and finally, the kind of centerpiece of the project is the UAS. So here's a video of uh, the Colorado, so CU Boulder team, launching one of the Raven UAS on what would then become the Imperial Nebraska uh, mothership supercell. However, the supercell is not that impressive at this point, it's just at the beginning of its life cycle. You're gonna see it in a second as the camera pans around here. So got a nice flat base, so a little bit of an RFD cut coming in but no real structure on it yet. That would happen once it moves into far western Nebraska. So we had a lot of good IOPs or intensive observation periods on the 2019 kind of season of Taurus. Why 8 June? So when I started my PhD, I really wanted to focus on assimilating UAS data and seeing how that affected storm scale ensemble forecasts. And June 8 seemed to be this perfect uh, kind of case to start with for this. Since we had some really good UAS observations, on these two supercells we saw in Northwest Kansas, one of which was tornadic and the other which was non-tornadic. There were all sorts of mesoscale uh, influences which may have influenced this, and I wanted to see if assimilating UAS data would help with forecasts of that and resolving some of these influences. But once I started digging into that data, I realized I'd also need an observational case study part of this. That kind of grew into half of my dissertation too. So, Speaking of case studies, we're going to do a very, very brief overview of this case so we can kind of see what's going on here. Uh, starting at 500, so kind of a top-down analysis here. You've got a decent trough moving out of the Intermountain West and with some fairly decent flow over the um, front range of the Rockies here and out into the eastern Colorado Plains. So again, you've got 25 knots there at 500, which is not usually something great, but with good enough low-level flow, you can get enough shear for supercells here. And because you've got that westerly flow crossing the mountain barrier, we did have Lee's cyclogenesis. And for the lower level analysis here, we're going to focus on this region highlighted in red. So looking at this here, we've got our Lee cycle, and again over kind of southeast Colorado. We have a cold front nudging into the northeastern part of the state, bringing some nice upslope flow. We did have some upslope supercells behind that boundary that we didn't end up targeting. And there's also a dry line uh, mixing out of southeastern Colorado, leading to a triple point just west of Canarado, which is one of my favorite place names out here. <laughs> so the supercell, the first supercell of the day, initiated just like pretty much on that triple point just before 20 UTC, so around 1930 or so. And looking at our kind of more traditional parameters we look at for supercell favorability, just a kind of a Cape Shear map here. 
We've got over 3,000 joules per kilogram of cape, so we're definitely good in the cape department here, and around 40 knots of bulk shear, so sufficient for supersols. And this green dot is where our first supersol was at 20 UTC, so as it's kind of organizing into a supercell, so it's in a pretty decent environment there. So what happened? Well, this first supercell moved into uh, western Kansas and just kind of died. However, a second one developed right just south of where that first one died, rapidly intensified, turned right, and produced several tornadoes. So Taurus was on that first supercell as it moved into western Kansas and kind of fell apart. We then drove south to Sharon Springs, thinking we were done for the day. Uh, saw that new supercell fire enough, I thought, oh, we better turn around, and then went and collected observations on it. So we got a pretty good data set, but unfortunately we don't have a lot of data in between the two storms, which is kind of an important period for my observational case study. So the two research questions I really wanted to look at here is one for the observational case study. Why were these two supercells so different despite their close proximity in space and time? And then for the observing system experience, experiment, so for the data assimilation part of my project, how does assimilating different subsets of data from Taurus affect forecasts of these two supercells? So we're gonna start with the part of my uh, dissertation that's a bit more wrapped up at the moment. This part has actually been submitted as a manuscript to Monthly Weather Review. So fingers crossed that we'll get some helpful reviews back on that and we'll hopefully have it published later this spring. So, when I was doing my literature review, I kind of found five general things that can be very important in differentiating supercells in close proximity here. So five things that can kind of cause them to be different. So the first one is environmental heterogeneities. And that's the one that's kind of been focused on a lot in recent years. But these are just kind of boundaries in the near storm environment or gradients in different um, parameters or things like that. Uh, the second one is gonna be rapid temporal changes in the environment. So even if the storms are only an hour apart in time, if the environment changes a lot in that hour, that's gonna be very important. The third one is storm interactions or mergers. So even if you have two storms that are identical close to each other, if one of them has a left mover crash into it and the other one doesn't, that's gonna to lead to differences. Uh, the fourth one here is differences in convection initiation. And this one's had some really cool work by Matt Flournoy at, I think he's at SBC now actually, but uh, he's done some neat work running simulations with different areas and intensities of convection initiation in the same environment. And he was finding that stronger CI generally leads to supercells that will turn right faster and kind of strengthen faster. So we're gonna see if that is important in this case here. And the last one is internal storm features. So things like rear flank internal surges or SVCs, basically a lot of things that we're sampling in Taurus. It's kind of more of the stochastic thing. So even if you have supercells that are in the same environment, if they have different versions of these just from kind of stochastic variability, well, they may end up evolving differently. So we're gonna start with those environmental heterogeneities and we're gonna start with storm one. So looking again at our kind of surface analysis here, storm one developed right about here, so just a little bit east of that triple point, and it moved into a generally homogeneous warm sector. So there really wasn't much for storm one to interact with boundary-wise. However, in its wake, the story is a bit different for storm two. So this is a map I've made from our radar data at 2215, so as storm one is dying, and we've got uh, theta E traces from some of the mobile mesonets from Taurus, so these brighter yellow colors are higher theta E. And we've also got some very small surface obs plotted here from those uh, mobile mesonets. And we can see there's this outflow boundary just south of that dying storm one, and you've got winds that are back to the east, north of it, and southerly winds south of it. Furthermore, theta E is also higher just north of this boundary. And we were lucky enough that we weren't really going for this boundary. We were kind of done for the day and leaving storm one. But where uh, the right flank UAS landed was actually right in the middle of this high theta E area. So we have a nice landing profile from that UAS. So again, this air mass has back surface flow and higher theta E. So if you're a forecast, you're looking for severe weather, you can think, huh, the storm interacts with that that could be interesting, that could be more favorable. And storm two, about an hour later, does track right over that boundary location. So the boundary location at 22 UTC is here. And storm two, this is the uh, P3 reflectivity and dual Doppler uh, vertical wind. And this is the vertical wind at about 1.5 kilometers. So it's not that strong, but it's there. And you do have the updraft tracking right kind of over the boundary. So what did that, uh, 
air north of boundary actually look like? Well, we can combine our shallow UAS profile at that pink star here and the closest Taurus far field sounding to see what that environment looked like. So looking at our uh, kind of Franken sounding here, we've got in blue, this is the just raw far field sounding. And in red, you can kind of see it a bit here. This is uh, the far field sounding with the UAS data grafted on below 850 millibars. So you have this um, area right near the surface where it's much more moist and a good bit colder. So you have more cape, but also a lot more sin at the sur uh, with a surface-based parcel. And more intriguingly, if we look at the red and purple here, you've got a decent bit more low-level turning in the hodograph here. So a decent bit more low-level SRH in that uh, outflow environment than in the ambient environment here. So it's possible that if you get enough warming after storm one moves by, this environment could mix out some of that sin. However, that mixing may also mix out some of that better kinematics. And sadly, we didn't really have observations between when we left storm one and when we arrived back for storm two. So it's kind of an unknown as to how this boundary evolved between the storms. But it is possible that that better low-level kinematics could have helped storm two, assuming the destabilization happened without getting rid of that kinematics. But we are not done with boundaries here because there's another boundary that moves south towards storm two as it's initiating from cells to the north. And this is again, some outflow moving in. And this is visible as a fine line in the data from uh, the Goodland radar here. So as we move ahead in time, this is 2234. So as storm one is dying up here and storm two, can you guys see my cursor around here? No, you can't. All right. Well, uh, storm two just south and east of Canarado, I guess I'll have to use uh, geo references here. So southeast of Canarado, Storm 2 is beginning to develop. And Storm 1 is dying north and a little bit east of Goodland. So if we move forward to 2303 UTC, Storm 1 is just a little bit west of Goodland at this point. It's beginning to develop into a supercell. And that boundary is pretty much right on its doorstep here. But as Storm 1 really begins to consolidate into a supercell around 2330, that uh, outflow boundary from the north stalls out in a spot where you'd normally expect to see a left light convergence boundary or SVC in a mature supercell. So what I've kind of thought here is that could this boundary have provided a source of baroclinic vorticity? So could it have kind of been like an almost imported SVC for this storm and jump started low level meso and cold pool development? So it basically places this storm in almost a more mature stage than it otherwise would have been. So if you move about 15 minutes further into the future, that boundary doesn't really last too long once it stalls out. You get uh, increased divergence from the cold pool developing kind of over it, and it's no longer identifiable at 2346. But the storm does rapidly intensify during that time. So that may have partly been uh, due to kind of an assist provided from that boundary. Sadly, we don't really have good Taurus OBS through uh, like in situ in that boundary at this time or at this time, because Taurus is rapidly approaching from the south to uh, actually collect OBS in the storm. So the second kind of area I want to talk about here is rapid environmental changes. And at 20 UTC, so as Storm 1 is consolidating into a supercell, looking at our map of hodographs here, so I want to acknowledge Cameron Nixon for providing that code, uh, we've got decently long hodographs, but the low-level uh, SRH and low-level hodographs, so kind of the pink regions here, are very small. And if we look at our SRH in the background, that's not really over 50 in any of these areas here. It's just barely nudging up to surface to one SRH of 50 here. But during the evening, so 22 UTC doesn't change a lot. Uh, by zero UTC, you're starting to see a bit more little SRH and slightly longer hodographs. But zero to one UT, zero to two UTC, you really see a big change here. So you go from this to this. So you have a pretty decent area of surface to one SRH near or above 100 meters squared per second squared. So you get this uh, rapid intensification of the low-level jet or nocturnal boundary layer wind maximum here. And that lengthens the hodographs and makes the environment more favorable for tornadic supercells. Storm 1, of course, does not survive to experience this more favorable environment. So maybe if it had survived, it would have ended up being tornadic as well. So this is another way of looking at that from the actual Taurus soundings that we observed. So comparing that to the RAP uh, observations from the previous plots here. So if you look at these plots, the uh, yellow dots are storm one with storm one's observed motion. 
the green triangles are Storm 2, and that's its motion prior to its uh, sharp right turn that we'll talk about next. And this is Storm 2's motion in red, or Storm 2's uh, parameters calculated with its motion post its sharp turn that we'll talk about soon. So you can see that uh, between 0 and 1 UTC, that storm relative inflow really increases. Uh, storm relative velocity in the surface to 1 kilometer layer sharply jumps. So by 1 UTC, you're within the 25th to 75th percentile for the Thompson et al. Uh, weak tour data set. And LCLs also begin to drop by 1Z, so you're starting to get within what you'd expect for weak tornadoes. So one interesting thing I want to point out is that even though the storm relative inflow increases a fair bit from um, the pre-turn to post-turn motion, SRH doesn't really jump a lot. And that's because if you look at where the motion ends up on the hodograph, although you have stronger storm relative inflow, it moves a bit so that you have less streamwise vorticity. So there's maybe a bit more general vorticity in that layer, but the actual streamwise portion of it is a bit less. So the environment gets more favorable whether you look at the wrap or the actual observed torus soundings. Now, as that environment is becoming rapidly more favorable from 0z to 1z and 2z, Storm 2 underwent a merger that's really interesting because it happened with a rapidly developing updraft just west of it, kind of over its RFD. So this is a 7-kilometer AGL dual Doppler analysis from the P3, and the black contours on here are vertical velocity in 5 meter per second increments. So we start out with a supercell with a 15 meter per second updraft, which is not all that intense, but it does have decent supercell structure if we look at uh, 88D data or this. So you do have a kind of mature supercell here. And as we move forward from 0 to 12 to 0 to 27, you start to get development back here on the right flank. And this rapidly intensifies. So this is by 0 to 45. It's actually uh, stronger than the original updraft was at 0 to 12 at this point. And it intensifies even faster as we move forward here. So by 0 to 54, you've got a really nice B whir in here. And vertical velocity is between 40 and 50 meters per second, so pretty strong on that new updraft. And by 0105 UTC, that new updraft is the dominant updraft of the supercell. You've got a really well-defined B where it's almost like the storm is smiling at us here. And we've got 55 to 60 meters per second maximum updraft in the storm. So the other notable thing with this is that this merger leads to much more deviant motion in Storm 2. So at 0, 0, 012 here, it's kind of moving almost due east. But as this new updraft takes over, the storm dives to the southeast. And that more deviant motion means that it's kind of taking better advantage of its environment here. So you can also see this in the low-level evolution of the storm. If we look at uh, vertical vorticity, not much at 0, 0, 0012. But as we move forward here by 0, 0, 0054, you really get some better developed patches of vertical vorticity kind of in gray here, and low-level convergence in uh, black dashed lines. Again, this is one kilometer AGL dual Doppler analysis data. As we move from 0, 0, 0054 to 0, 0105, you get a rapid organization of that low-level meso. So a really well-defined max in vorticity here, and pretty well-defined low-level convergence along that RFD and below the meso. And this is actually when Taurus started seeing kind of this dust world below that, that ended up being tornado reports here. So you had some weak tornado reports at this time here, as that little of a meso really intensified. So, and then this again is uh, 0114 UTC, and just to show that the little of a meso does persist as uh, we move forward a bit here, kind of for completeness. So moving on to our second to last variable here, differences in DCI, and this is kind of the toughest one that I had to look at. So, Visually, a lot of us who were out there agreed that Storm 2 appeared to emerge from a more vigorous area of convection initiation than Storm 1. But how do we quantify this? So, I mean, this is just kind of pictures from out there. This is actually Storm 1 when it's fairly mature, and it really doesn't look all that good. Here's Storm 2 from a decent distance away as it's uh, beginning to initiate, and you've got a nice rain-free base here and a really crisp edge to that anvil and updraft. So clearly more vigorous convection in Storm 2. But again, how do we quantify this? Uh, we tried satellite, but Storm 2's DCI in the initial stages before it looks like this is actually obscured by Storm 1's anvils here. So it's tough to really get a good quantification of that from just satellite. I also tried looking at ZDR columns, but Storm 2's DCI happens so close to Goodland's radar site that the ZDR columns are kind of in the cone of silence. So that was disappointing. 
I finally decided to look at composite reflectivity time series, kind of normalized relative to the first 40 dBZ echo. And I was thinking that, all right, Storm 2 will probably have a more rapid increase in 40 dBZ area, and it'll also end up with a larger area. And boy, was I wrong. So turns out that Storm 1 actually has a larger and faster growing reflectivity core, and it's not even all that close. So I said, OK, what other things can I look at here? So I don't have dual Doppler data right around DCI from the P3, but I do have it about 30 minutes afterward. So I decided to see if, all right, are the reflectivity areas and updraft areas correlated at this point? And it turns out they're really not. So even at this point, uh, the blue dots are Storm 1's reflectivity area, and the blue stars are the updraft area. And Storm 1, so the red stars, red of both of those things are the same things for Storm 2. So looking at this, uh, even though Storm 1 has a larger reflectivity area, its updraft area is still smaller. So I'm not sure we can really draw the conclusion I was thinking about drawing from that first plot of this based on this. So the 40 dBZ reflectivity area may not be a very good proxy for the updraft size. However, if we do look at that 30 to 60 minutes after DCI window for both storms using the dual Doppler analyses, Storm 2 clearly has a stronger and larger updraft. So this is that updraft area at a bunch of different levels here in the dual Doppler analysis from 0 to 18 kilometers. And all the warm colors are Storm 2. So Storm 2 has clearly got a larger updraft at pretty much all the times we looked at. And same thing here, warm colors are Storm 2, cold colors are Storm 1. And the updraft speed in this case is also larger in Storm 2. So unfortunately, 30 to 60 minutes after DCI doesn't really tell us too much about what happened at DCI. So we can say that as they're both organizing into supercells, Storm 2 definitely has a larger updraft, but we can't really, I think, infer that that definitely means that Storm 2 came from a larger, stronger area of DCI. And our last feature, or kind of difference we're going to look at here, is internal storm features. And we've got a really interesting one here. So we have a strong rear flank internal surge that wraps around the backside of Storm 2 as that merger is going on. So it actually originates as an outflow surge coming from this chunk of convection that's kind of breaking off of Storm 2 at this point and becoming a left mover. And by 0029, it's kind of knocking on the door of that developing updraft that becomes the new dominant updraft for Storm 2. By 0035, it's, again, almost directly below it. So what may have happened here is that it's possible that uh, convergence along ahead of that boundary may have strengthened the new updraft. And furthermore, it's also possible that propagation along that rear flank internal surge may have helped contribute to Storm 2's more rightward deviant motion. So that may have allowed Storm 2 to, again, better use its environment. Uh, as that internal surge interacts with the little meso, it also kind of wraps it up a bit more. So that may have also contributed to the uh, development of a really tight little meso and tornado production just after 0104 here. So kind of a summary of this, just to wrap all of the part one up, uh, the boundaries, mesoscale heterogeneities here, uh, it's likely that Storm 2's interaction with a stronger level kinematics helped it. The impact of that second boundary is a little bit less certain, so we don't have many observations around it. Uh, the thing I'm most confident on is that those rapid environmental changes were very helpful for Storm 2. So getting that increase in SRH, the level shear, and a little decrease in the LCL height made it more likely to be tornadic. Uh, the differences in DCI is kind of on the other end of the spectrum. That's the one I'm most uh, uncertain about. And Storm mergers, the merger that Storm 2 underwent definitely appears to have led to a stronger, better organized, low and mid-level meso and more deviant motion. And then finally, that rear flank internal surge may have kind of interacted with that new developing updraft during the merger to help it uh, get a more deviant motion and to become stronger. So on to part two here. So I'm going to go through this a little bit quicker since we're running a bit low on time. But this is the observing system experiments part. So this is the more DA-based side of it. And this is the part that I'm still actively working on a bit more. So the first part's a bit more wrapped up. This part's a bit more in the air. So this is the fun part. All right, so background here. Representing the evolution of individual storms in NWP is rather difficult, but we're going to need to do it well in order to meet the goals of things like warn on forecast and extend warning lead times beyond 15 to 20 minutes or so. Uh, we need a good initial representation to do this of both the storm and the storm's environment. So you can get the storm through radar DA, 
but you need a really good observational network around the storm to get the environment. And it's possible in a lot of cases that we don't quite have that at the moment. So could special obs like Taurus help? So that's what I'm trying to figure out here. And to do that, um, I'm running a data denial experiment framework. But instead of looking at individual platforms, I'm looking at regions of the atmosphere. So I have the surface space, which is just the mobile Methanet obs from Taurus, the PBL space, which is the UAS observations, and the lower part of each um, radio sound observation from the surface to 2,500 feet AGL. So we kind of cut that off at the highest flight the UAS are allowed to fly. And finally, I have the free atmosphere observation. So that's everything above where the UAS are allowed to fly from the radio sounds. And to actually uh, get that impact from each one of these, I run a control experiment with just the conventional OBS, an all experiment where I assimilate the conventional OBS and the whole kitchen sink from Taurus. And then I run an experiment where I deny one of those data sets to the model for each one. So to get, say, the impact of the surface data set, I compare the all experiment and the experiment that doesn't assimilate the surface data. So uh, I tried to set this up as similarly as possible to WAFs. So it's a 36-member ensemble, three-kilometer vertical spa or horizontal spacing, uh, 51 vertical levels. And then you've also got uh, physics diversity in here as a, in addition to initial condition perturbations. And there's background fields, again, where the one-hour WAFs forecast that I got from Kent Knopfmeyer, and the boundary fields are the 12Z3. So as far as the actual DA cycling goes, I cycle it every 15 minutes from 18Z through 01Z, and that's using the DART ENKF, which has been good to work with. Uh, for the control experiment, I'm just assimilating and cycling those uh, conventional observations. So METAR and MESONET, uh, ACARS and RADAR-Z. And that's all similar to using the settings from Jones et al. 2020. So kind of make it as similar to worn on forecast as possible. So pretty big localization for the METAR and MESONET OBS, or METAR and ACARS OBS, smaller for the MESONET OBS, and then smaller still for the RADAR observations. For the TORUS data, I started assimilating that at 21Z for the various TORUS DA experiments. And for the UAS, I'm assimilating U and V wind, temperature and specific humidity. Same things for the mobile mesonet data. And for the mobile sounding data, it's the same, except I use relative humidity instead of specific humidity. And there's more info on those DART settings and error characteristics for these OBS later. And from this cycling DA system, I launch free forecasts at 22 UTC, 23 UTC, 0Z, and 1Z. So before I can assimilate all that wonderful Taurus data, I have to process it so Dart can actually bring it in. So the method that I use for processing it is based on some methods developed here at NCAR by Jensen et al. and James Pinot and his group. Uh, the MOV mesonet and UAS OBS are binned in 15-minute intervals first for each cycle. The UAS OBS are also binned every 10 HPA in the vertical. Then both these data sets are gridded onto a 6-kilometer grid in the horizontal using MetPy. The MOV mesonet, of course, just at the surface. That'd be a slight problem if the MOV mesonet was not at the surface. And UAS OBS are then also gridded in those 10 HPA bins in the horizontal. So you've got kind of a slice at each horizontal uh, bin. So this is what that looks like for the Taurus uh, mobile mesonet temperatures. The kind of dots are the temperature values in Kelvin here. And the kind of technicolor tracks are the mobile mesonet tracks here. So here's uh, the V wind. What you're actually seeing here is uh, this is outflow from Storm 2. So it's colder. And you've got a more northerly V wind. And then this is what those UAS OBS look like. So the larger circles are closer to the surface. And you can just see that uh, the winds are changing with height here, which is nice. That, that kind of a Captain Obvious thing here. Uh, you might be wondering about the soundings, though. So for the mobile sounding observations, I bend those every 10 HPA like the UAS, UAS OBS and average them. But they're not analyzed to a grid. They're assimilated at the average location for each of those 10 HPA bends. And I did some tests to see if the structure of the sounding is kept up well by this technique, and it is. Uh, I've got all these green dashes, or the dashed lines here are the actual averaged data, and the solid lines are the raw data, and they match up fairly well. So we're not losing a bunch of structure in the sounding by doing this averaging. So this comes to the uh, big questions part here, things that haven't really been figured out too much yet, and that's how do we actually assimilate these uh, field project observations. What are the best practices for doing that? Uh, there's been some previous work assimilating different field project data, and it varies a fair bit. 
So Jensen and all 2021's work from here at NCAR, uh, they have a 127 kilometer localization for their UAS OBS from lap straight. Uh, looking at WAFs, even though it's not fuel project data, it's pretty densely spaced with Oklahoma's Mesonet observations, and those are a 60 kilometer localization. So less dense than the UAS OBS, but kind of a smaller localization. Uh, Sapini et al. 2016, who uh, he assimilated both Mesina OBS from Vortex 2, and they used a 50 kilometer localization for that. So the Taurus OBS I'm assimilating, as far as air characteristics go, so the next kind of setting we want to look at, range from really well known, which radio sounds like we know what those air characteristics are, to fairly unknown. The Raven UAS, we really don't have a good handle on that yet. So I ended up deciding on a 50 kilometer horizontal localization and half kilometer scale height localization for all the Taurus OBS. For the Mof Mezina OBS, it is a 3.5 meters per second uh, error for UNV, 2.5 Kelvin for METAR, and Q kind of variance of 3.62 grams per kilogram. So basically the METAR defaults in DART. Uh, the UAS error, like uh, specs, are based on the ACAR defaults in DART. And then the radio sound error specs are based on what uh, Mike Canaglio's work has used previously for assembling mobile radio sounds, which is pretty close to the radio sound um, defaults in DART. So I've run into a number of notable difficulties with assimilating this data set. Uh, the kind of biggest one right now is that 15 minute free forecast between cycles had this huge cold bias at the surface. I'm still not sure why. So setting ISF flux and iCloud to zero in the name list is the only reasonable fix I've found so far. But that's not something I want to keep doing because that's supposed to be just setting for an idealized run and not a real data run. So this is an example of this here. This is a 15 minute free forecast from some initial conditions I made. And the kind of dots on here are Kansas mesonid OBS. And you can see that it's much too cold compared to the Kansas mesonid OBS. And here's the temperature drop in that 15 minutes. So under cloud cover, it's about a three to six Fahrenheit temperature drop and out of cloud cover it's between one and four. So it's a pretty big drop. Uh, other difficulties, I found out that Assembling specific humidity as the moisture variable for METAR led to a big dry bias, so I changed that to dew point. I'm also at some point going to try to do that for the Taurus OBS as well to see if that helps my experiment a bit. And radar DA in this case often places storms too far east. So if anyone has experience with uh, running into that particular problem or running into this problem, please let me know because I'm definitely looking for answers for this. So with all that out of the way, what does the control run look like here? So I've got a uh, control run output for 00, 0 UTC for that set of free forecasts. They're all kind of similar in how they, uh, in their air characteristics and things. So we've got temperature plot in the background here. We have uh, reflectivity in red. So the red contour is the 35 dBZ contour of composite reflectivity. And the black contour is verifying MRMS data of the same thing. So you can see that the storms are roughly in the right spots, but a little bit too far east. They move a bit too fast. And there's also a warm and dry bias in and near the cold pool and under the anvil where the Taurus OBS are probably gonna have the most effect here. So this is just for the control run, kind of looking at error stats here. I'm gonna draw your attention to the Sherman and Cheyenne mesonet stations, which this is Cheyenne, this is Sherman here. They're the ones that are in the cold pool. And they've got a warm bias and a dry bias in dew point. Uh, Colby, which is under the anvil here, is also a bit warm and dry. And we're also going to look at how that compares to some of our mobile soundings from Taurus. So this is the control experiment in uh, solid lines here compared to the observed sounding in dashed. And you can see that our PBL is, strangely enough, too cold, too dry, and too deep, which is not a combination you see too often. And the vertical wind profile is really missing this nice uh, kind of loop here in the lowest kilometer. So we're also missing the cap in that 2357 sounding. So can the Taurus DA help with this? Well, comparing our all run, which assimilates the whole kitchen sink of Taurus data and the control run, you get some warming here, kind of that southern portion of the cold pool, cooling in the northern bit, and you get kind of a donut of increased moisture here around a bit of uh, drying in the center of that cold pool. Uh, the contours here, red is control where the storm is, and blue is all, so it doesn't move the storm around much but you do get uh, a bit of an improvement in that cold pool. It kind of moves a little bit north and west if you just look at the individual uh, ensemble means here. And if we look at the individual uh, experiments, so this is no free, looking at the 
impact of that free atmosphere subset. The spatial kind of distributions of things don't match up too well here. So the kind of dominant influence on that all experiment is probably not the free atmosphere data. If you look at no PBL, it gets a little bit closer. You get that donut and moisture showing up pretty well. And the no surface uh, experiment is really the one that has kind of the closest impact here. So this matches the spatial pattern of the all experiment compared to control pretty well. So I think a lot of that impact at the surface, as expected, comes from the surface subset. But the PBL and free atmosphere still make contributions, especially to that dew point field. So here's looking at the bias at all those Kansas mesonet stations in kind of a table format again. And we can see that for Sherman within the cold pool, we do get a um, better outcome when looking at all these experiments, except for or even no surface is a better outcome. But all the 50 kilometer experiments here have better outcomes. Um, looking at localizations of 100 and 150, but I just kind of ran to see what would happen. They're not that much better. Uh, looking at Cheyenne, it actually gets a little bit worse. And for dew point uh, observations, once you start assimilating uh, the PBL and surface data, you really get a decent improvement in dew point for both of those sites. So it seems like you're representing the cold pool somewhat better. And surface OBS are kind of most important here, followed by PBL. But if we look at the uh, vertical soundings here, again, this is control. And if we look at all, we do get a much better representation of that low level hodograph. And we start to get that cap, and the boundary layer gets a little bit uh, less deep and a little bit more moist. So it does help a bit there. Still struggles, but it's better than control. So, and I still want to point out here that uh, we are assimilating the lowest portion of this sounding. So it's not like a really good verification of uh, data that was not assimilated, but it's kind of what we have to work with at this point here. So how does this affect the free forecasts? Well, I'm going to show neighborhood probability. So this is the probability of reflectivity exceeding 40 dBZ within a 15 kilometer neighborhood of a point. And kind of the uh, brighter yellow colors are higher probs here. And then the black contours are verifying MRMS reflectivity. And this is a 15 minute forecast. So as you can see, storms are a bit too far east at this point. And as you move forward, the all experiment has our initial storm survive and begin moving uh, kind of south and east of its location. However, the control experiment kills off that initial storm and allows convection that was behind it to kind of persist in this location over the initial storm's cold pool. So looking at individual paintball uh, plots and individual like members, this is pretty disorganized convection. It's not a nice supercell like there should be. So if we move forward at, uh, further out, by 145, even the all run kind of kills off the supercell that should be there. And the control run still has disorganized convection up here, roughly in kind of a decent spot. So we've got storms, but they're not the storms we're looking for. <laughs> And if we look at uh, fraction skill score, which I computed from those plots, you do see a decent decrease in skill, especially after that uh, storm that's present in all starts to die off. So if we look at just those uh, objective verification metrics, you do have a worse forecast for the all run, which is not according to plan. <laughs> I wanted to improve the model forecast, and it made it a bit worse. So kind of question I want to get to now is, what next? So I really want to work on improving that radar DA to put the storms in the right spots. I think that part of what we're seeing here is that we're improving the environment. But if the storm is in the wrong place, it can't quite take advantage of that improved environment. Uh, this may, uh, the like, first step I want to look at for this is actually adding radio velocity data to the model. So assimilate those radio velocity OBS from the ADAD network and see if that helps. Uh, the Next kind of big thing I want to look at is figuring out why that cold PBL bias is happening in those 15 minute integrations. So it'd be nice to actually be able to have iCloud and ISF flux turned on during DA, because I do notice there's that bit of a warm bias in the cold pool that happens. And I think that's partly from turning those off. I want to test different localizations for the soundings versus other OBS, because it's possible that the soundings being more sparsely spaced may do better with a larger localization value than the densely packed uh, UAS or mobile messenger OBS. And finally, I want to test, uh, take the PBL data set and break it down into profiles, so vertical profiles and horizontal transects, to see if it's more important to capture that vertical profile variability or the variability in the horizontal in this particular case. So with that, uh, I will now take any questions. Or oh, if there's no questions, you can just look at this wonderful picture of our 8 June mothership. <laughs>
Take some water. <laughs> so do we have any questions here in the room? Uh, and if you're online, um, the Slido should be just below the, um, the, the webcast video. So please enter your questions there. Really interesting talk, uh, Matt. I have to uh, not call you Matt, man. I keep <laughs> doing that. Um, <laughs> uh, so you showed the data denial experiments, and you compared the all to you know control run. Did you notice any of the other data denial parameters or you know uh, runs? Did they kill off all kill off the storm too, or were there any that like you know had any variability there? Yeah, that's a really great question, Austin. Thanks. So. Unfortunately, uh, they pretty much all killed off the storm. So wow, it was interesting. interesting seeing that like, even with uh, some of the cases where that little hodograph didn't improve much, you still just get that storm to immediately kind of croak. Well, thanks, Matt. So actually, I have a question, uh, yeah. or a couple questions. Um, so in your ensemble design, you know, you're trying to stay close to what WAFs had, uh, but I noticed that there were I think there were cumulus parameterizations that were selected, even though this is a three kilometer uh, grid spacing uh, set of simulations. Uh, have you tried turn have you tried using explicit convection instead of uh, cumulus parameterizations? Oh, I should have made that more clear. So I am using explicit convection. Uh, I just grabbed that paper from the or the figure from the Jones paper, and they actually used the cumulus parameterizations in their outer nest, but not uh, in the inner okay. nest. So that, okay. That was my bad. I should have made that more clear. OK, no worries. Uh, so my second question pertains to iCloud. Have you looked into testing iCloud equal 3? I don't think I've done that. That is a great suggestion. I will try that. Uh, so, the <laughs> so, Gre so Greg Thompson is the one who implemented that uh, into, uh, into Wharf. So he's no longer at RAL. Now he's at JCSDA, which is basically just down the street in FL4, I think. Um, anyway, so I think that has to do more with like, um, I think subgrid cloud. Um, so that might also have, that might have an effect on the amount of radiation that's hitting, uh, that's, that's hitting the surface. And that might also, it could possibly have an effect on the strength of the, the cold pool and the cold bias. So it's, that might be something worth at least trying. I have no idea if it'll solve the problem, but uh, since that option does exist and you're playing around with tweaking iCloud uh, or the iCloud setting, may as well at least try that and see what happens. Yeah, I will definitely check that out. Funny enough, I think I was going through the different iCloud values and I stopped it too. <laughs> yeah, that's a, uh, iCloud 3 is a newer one. Uh, question online from Sean Merdzek at NOAA, um, very interesting talk, Matt. Have you looked at the individual ensemble members to see if certain physics suites don't have that cold bias near the surface that you see in the ensemble mean? Is it possible that one physics combo is resulting in the really cold biases? Yeah, that's a really good question. Thanks, Sean. So uh, I've looked at a number of the different physics combinations, but not systematically. And it seems like it happens pretty much no matter what uh, physics options from that kind of list in the ensemble that I pick. But I should go through it systematically and really see if any of them are worse than the others or not. Yeah, th thanks, Matt. This is really interesting stuff. Um, and I appreciate all the questions from the audience, too. And I, my, my sort of a follow-up on the iCloud and the ISFX, FLX, I think it was the other one. Um, I don't know if you showed the result after you set those to zero. And I, I was just curious how close to reality you were getting with by taking some of the reality out of the model. <laughs> yeah, that's an excellent question. I should have put uh, a slide in there that was like, all right, this is the 15 minute forecast before, this is the 15 minute one after that I'm using kind of for cycling. And it does seem like it gets a lot closer to reality. But the problem is that in the cold pool, it actually goes a little bit beyond and has a bit of a warm bias. So it, Especially in the like open warm sector, it gets better, which is good. <laughs> which is weird because it should be getting worse because you're making it not as close to reality, but model land is interesting. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience or online? No? Okay. 
Well, uh, let's, let's thank our speaker again. I uh, appreciate you coming from Nebraska, driving out here, and um, staying this week at NCAR. He's available all week, so if you'd like to talk to him further in person, uh, just either email me or Matt, and uh, we can set something up. So with that, uh, let's thank Matt one more time. Yep, thanks a bunch for having me, guys. This is great. <laughs>